We begin a brand new series today that is called, Okay, God, Prove It. All right, okay, God, prove it. And I know it's a strange title, but for the next two weeks, I'm gonna talk about the blessing of God on our lives. And the reason why I entitled it, Okay, God, Prove It, is I'm basing that off of a verse that's found in the Old Testament. I'll talk more about it next week. But basically, God talks about a promise. It's actually even a command. And he says, if you do this, if you are a good steward of your resources, that you know what, you can test me and see that I will bless you. This is the only command in the word of God and the only promise in the word of God that God says to test him. It's very interesting. Out of all the promises and all the commands that are found in the Bible, this is the only one that he says, test me. And so I decided to name this, okay, God, prove it. Prove it. We want to put him to the test in a good way, not an irreverent way, in a good way. And so for the next two weeks, I want to talk specifically about how being a giver attracts God's blessing. Now, when I say that, people get funny when you start talking about money in church. They just do. They get funny. They get funny about it, and they're, they're like, oh, man, you shouldn't talk about money in church. And, and can I tell you something? If that's true, then we need to eliminate about one-third of the parables that Jesus talked about because one-third of the parables had to do with money or possessions. And so if I were to really preach like Jesus, that means about one out of every three or every four sermons, I'm talking about money and possessions. If I were to really be like Jesus, that is. And so this is the thing. The reason why I want to talk about possessions, I want to talk about money, I want to talk about blessing, is because, number one, you cannot live without money. And everybody said a big amen, right? You literally cannot live without it. It's impossible to have a quality life without money. It requires money to purchase clothes and shelter and food and things like that. Number two, money is neither good nor bad. I know some of you maybe grew up in a church where maybe they said to you that, you know what, money is the root of all evil. Money is bad. That's actually a misquote of a verse. The Bible does not say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. But you know what, your relationship with money determines whether money is being used in a good or a bad way. Do you understand that? And the third thing is this, money doesn't turn you into somebody else. We think money turns us into somebody else. No, it just makes you more of who you already are. So I say that to say, if you're amazing and I were to give you a million dollars, you're just going to become more amazing. If you're a jerk, well, I won't go there, but you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> See, money is a magnifier. It just basically brings out your true colors, you could say. And really, if you tell me, why am I putting this series? Why did we, in all of like the weeks, we have 52 weeks to talk about various things in the Word of God. I sit down with a team. We pray. We spend a long time saying, God, what is it that you want to communicate to City First? Why did I put these two weeks on the calendar, this week and next week? Here's the reason why. Here's the reason why. Because so many people I talk to are stressed about money. There's like a stress. In fact, in 2018, CNBC reported a survey that was done, and the survey was done of Americans, and it said this, 30% of Americans, and here's the word, constantly are stressed about money. That's one-third almost of Americans. That's tens of millions of people that are, quote, constantly stressed about money. In fact, in another study, 71% of millennials, now let me just quantify millennials. We think of millennials as 14-year-olds. Those aren't millennials, that's Gen Z, all right? Millennials actually have kids now and are in their 30s, many of them. So millennials, 71% of millennials say they are stressed continuously because they do not have a three-month emergency plan. So they don't have a, a fund that if something happens, a sickness, a layoff, an issue, that they have no money to be able to sustain. So they're stressed about this. And so I want to talk about this idea of blessing and finances and resources and assets and all of those things because this is a part of life. If I, as your pastor, were not to talk about it, I would be doing you a disservice because money is a part of life. You can't escape it. I can't escape it, you can't escape it. You know, one time a comedian says the, said this, he said, everything's amazing and no one is happy. 
And I started to think about that. You know what? Really, if you think about it, it's true. Does anybody here own an iPhone? Just, just real quickly wave at me if you own it. Okay, I need, I need four iPhones. I promise I'm going to give them back. I'm not going to do anything, all right, with them. So four people, real quickly, just run, 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 run. Okay, here, got one. All right, I got one right here. Two, three, four. All right, good. Thank you. All right, well, sorry. There's, there are more people that are running to give me iPhones than I have the ability to make an illustration here. All right, so here we have four iPhones. I don't know whose they are, but can I tell you this? Let me show you this. What I'm holding in my hand right now, okay, what I'm holding in my hand right now, in 1965, you could have purchased this. Right here. So I look at that now. I need somebody to who is honest to redistribute these iPhones back to their original owners, all right? Whoever that is. Laura, you're honest. You're, you're our worship leader here, so you can do this. Thank you. All right. So anyway, think about that. What I held in my hand back in 1965, you could have bought a Mustang. First series, Mustang. In 1950, in 1950, the average single-family home had 983 square feet in it. That was in 1950. In 2014, the average single-family home in America has 2,657 square feet. We have more than doubled the amount of square footage in our single-family homes, and our families are smaller. In fact, in most of human history, think about this, most of human history, people have not been able to leave a 100-mile radius of where they were born. In other words, where they were born, they basically lived their entire life within 100 miles of where they were born. Now, we have people who say, you know what, I don't like the climate where I live, and so therefore, I'm going to move somewhere else. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but think about that. For most of human history, for thousands of years, that wasn't even a possibility. You know, in Jesus' day, the average marriage lasted 12 years. And here's the reason why. The rate of deaths to women giving birth to children was sky high. And so the average marriage only lasted 12 years because women, many times giving birth, would die. And you say, oh, that was 2,000 years ago. Okay, let's go back 100 years ago. A hundred years ago, during World War I, Great Britain did a study, and they found this out about women in Great Britain. So this is not a third world nation. This is Great Britain a hundred years ago, okay? A hundred years ago, women in Great Britain had the same chance of surviving childbirth as they did in a foxhole on the front lines of World War I. We have made a lot of advances as a culture, as a globe, as a society. And I realize there's still areas of our nation where death rates are real high and survival rates are real low and such like that. But let's talk about America for a moment. In America, even in the last 100 years, 70 years, and 20 years, there's been great prosperity. We have all kinds of blessings. In fact, even right now, even right now, as I am talking, my wife and my son, Caden, they're in a hospital room up in Rochester, Minnesota, because Caden had surgery. Thank you for many of you that prayed for that. So Jen is there. It's her birthday, by the way. Happy birthday, babe. And you know what? And so they're there. And he had this, uh, this surgery that was done. He's been very public about it. That's why I'm, I'm saying it. And he had this surgery that was done. And you know what? This amazing medical advancements. We have so many blessings, whether it be material things, whether it be medical advances, whether it be in our culture, so many advances, even in the last hundred years. But guess what? Everything's amazing and no one is happy. <laughs> And here's the reason why. Because happiness doesn't come from more. Happiness doesn't come from more. We have more. Now, listen, don't feel bad about having more. Don't feel bad about your iPhone. Don't feel bad about the fact that we have medical advancements. Thank God for that, right? Thank God that we have wisdom. We know more about science. We have bigger homes, maybe bigger apartments. We have cars that last longer. All of these things. We have a car. I mean, you know... I mean, literally, it's great. It's a blessing. But this is the thing. Happiness doesn't come from those things. I know you've heard that before, but do you believe me when I say it? Do I believe me when I say it? You see, our happiness is sourced differently than what we think. Here's another truth. 
God wants you to be blessed and full of joy. It's really true. God wants you to be blessed. Now, I'm going to say something, though, that's going to make you scratch your head a little bit, all right? And here's what I'm going to say. And some of you are going to go, hmm, all right? First of all, I don't believe it's God's will that we are poor. I don't believe that. Now, I got some amens on that, all right? I don't believe that. I would also say this. I don't believe it's God's will that we're necessarily rich. Now, I got a few amens on that, but a few less amens on that, all right? <laughs> now, now, here's the reason why. Listen, what's rich? See, I've been to places in this world where rich is that you own a cow and a goat. That's rich. So what's rich? I mean, rich is kind of relative to where you live, right? Here's what I believe is God's will. God's will is for you to be blessed. See, that's the thing. Because this is what I know. I know people that have a lot of money that are blessed, and I know people that have maybe not as much money that are also blessed. You see, God wants us to be blessed, and how much money we have, well, that kind of goes up and down, but that doesn't determine whether we're blessed or not. Blessed means that God's favor is on our life, that God has given us everything that we need. He'll give us more than enough Ultimately, blessing is this. He saved us. Jesus died for us, that our sins are forgiven, and we're going to heaven, right? So this is what I know. God does want us to be blessed, but the amount of money does not determine whether or not you're blessed. There are all kinds of different types of people out there, those that have more money, less money, some that are blessed, some that are not. You know, as we talk about this idea of blessing, I want to just say this real quickly. This is not a give to get sermon series. And what I mean by that is some of you maybe have heard of or you've been a part of maybe a church or a theology that says, if you give $100, God will give you $1,000. It's kind of like he's a slot machine in Vegas or something like that, all right? That's not what this is about. We do not believe that theology. This, I believe, instead is about this, that you are to get to give. It's a get to give series. It's about generosity, which brings blessing. I want you to have a blessed life, and you won't be blessed if you just hoard it all to yourself. Rather, instead, God says you have to release part of it. And so um, I want to tell you a story, and, and it's a story about a young man who was a runaway in a large city in America. He left his home because he was going to kind of go off and do his own thing, and pretty soon he began to run out of money, and he ran out of food, he ran out of resources, he was sleeping on the streets. He had to beg and steal to be able to survive, and one morning he kind of was fed up with it. He said, you know, I'm going to go to the rich side of town. I'm going to figure out how to get into a rich neighborhood, and I'm going to be able to take some things there because I need to be able to survive, and so he made his way to a rich neighborhood, and these are the neighborhoods that the houses had gates and fences and pools and gardens and they were very large and he got there and he snuck in through some shrubbery into the back of this one large mansion and when he was there there was this beautiful manicured garden and food you know all these different types of food being grown a huge pool and so he began to take some of the food and eat it real quickly and then he turned around and he's like he kind of got a little agitated a little frustrated he goes you know what I don't like it that this person has this much money and I don't. And so he decided he was going to vandalize the place. So he started vandalizing the garden. He took the pool lawn chairs and stuff and dumped it into the pool. He went, found a spray can. He went up to the house and he began to write curse words on the house and things like that. Then he left and he went back to where he was living. And, uh, and you know, the police were obviously notified and surveillance video was looked at and Within about a week, they ID'd the young man, and they found him on the streets, and they arrested him, and they notified the owner of the home that they had actually arrested the person that had vandalized his house. Well, the owner of the home did something really interesting. The owner of the home decided not to press charges. He went even further than that. What he decided to do is he decided to take and, and actually pay for a defense attorney so that this young runaway could be exonerated from all of the different charges that were brought against him by the actual city. And so over a period of time, the young man was actually able to be released from all responsibility. The owner paid for all of the defense lawyer fees and 
Then the owner did something that was unheard of. He decided to start a relationship and a friendship with this young man, he took him out to eat, to breakfast and such. And over the next couple months, the owner decided that he was gonna adopt this young man into his family. And so what he did is he actually went through all the legal process and adopted this young man and brought this young man into his home and made him like a blood son, an adopted son. And, and this man already had one son that was a blood son, and now he has two with this new runaway that had become an adopted son. And, and he changed his will. The, the owner changed his will and included both kids in the will. So instantaneously, almost overnight, this runaway became adopted and became a multimillionaire. And then the owner of this home decided that he was going to give it, go one step further, and he decided to make the new son a partner in the family business and gave him not only shares like stock, but also gave him a position with authority to make decisions. And over the next like couple years, this, this adopted son began to actually manage part of the family business, and the dad said this. The dad said, listen, I'm always a cell phone call away, or you you can come and talk to me whenever you want. I mean, this is an amazing, amazing story. Even during setbacks, the dad said, listen, you will always have access to me. This is a true story. It's a true story about you. Now, some of you are going, what do you mean? Because basically what I just told was a modern day parable of what God did for each and every one of us. Every single one of us at one point, we're rebellious against God. We deserved punishment. Many of us maybe even cursed God. We were angry. We were doing our own thing. And then God came to the rescue. And you know what he did? He paid for our defense. He paid so that we didn't have to pay the penalty for our wrongdoing. And then he adopted us into his family. It says in Romans that we became adopted and that we can call out to God, Abba, Father, is actually how it's translated, which means in English, Daddy, Daddy, that we can look to the Heavenly Father and say, you are a dad to us. And so at that point, we were adopted. And then you know what he said? He said, not only am I going to give you salvation, not only are your sins going to be erased, but I'm going to actually bring you into the family business. And I'm going to give you responsibility with the kingdom work. And at any point in life, you have a direct access to me. Then no longer do you have to go through someone else. You don't have to stand behind a curtain like in the Old Testament. But rather, instead, now you can come directly to the Father and that we are co-heirs with Christ. Some of you may not even know this, but it says that we're co-heirs with Christ, which means the same inheritance, the same blessing that God gives to Jesus, he gives gives to us. Do you understand that? And so, why do I tell you this? Why do I tell you this story? Well, simply, imagine this. It's because the very first step of understanding blessing and understanding stewardship, that I'll explain what that word means in a minute, starts with this truth. You belong to God. This is the baseline. The stage that I'm standing on right now, it's supporting me. This talk, both weeks, is supported by this foundational truth. You and I belong to God. We belong to God. It starts there. If we don't understand that, you're not going to understand anything else I say for the rest of today or, tomorrow or next week. You're not going to understand any of it. We belong to God. We have to understand that. He loves us. He created us. He rescued us. In fact, I love what it says in 1 Corinthians here. The Apostle Paul is talking about this whole idea, and he says, you are God's expensive purchase, paid for with tears of blood, so that by all means, then use your body or your life to bring glory to God. Paul's saying, you were purchased with a great price. Jesus walking to that cross was no cakewalk. That was something that was very difficult. He gave his entire life so that we could be adopted into God's family. Jesus gave everything. We definitely get the better end of the deal on this. It cost Jesus everything. We were lost, but now we're found. We gave Jesus our sin 
and he gave us life. But here's where it's more than just an exciting thought. Here's where we have to then ask a subsequent question. If we belong to God, then who owns my stuff? You see, at that moment, we get a little uncomfortable and conflicted, right? But let me go back to that modern day parable for a moment. Imagine this, imagine that that young man that was a runaway that now got adopted into the new family that had been given absolutely everything, given a new start, a new future, forgiven from past, given true riches. Now imagine that newly adopted son started to get possessive about the things that had been given to him. Think about if he started taking credit for the blessings that the father had given to him, that all of a sudden that new adopted son was like, well, I earned all this. This is all mine. And, and, and I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm gonna hang on to it, white knuckle it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang on to it. I'm not gonna let, let it go because you know what? All this money, the house, the gardens, all the things that the owner the father had given, now it's mine. That wouldn't make any sense, would it? We'd want to go up to that young man and slap him upside the head. Because we're like, are you kidding me? This isn't your stuff. You see, who owns the world? Who owns our stuff? Who owns everything? Well, the psalmist says it this way. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Let me give you the Hebrew word there, what it means for everything. The Hebrew word means everything. Everything. I can't pronounce it, but I will tell you this. It is translated everything. So the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. So guess what? We belong to him. Nature belongs to him. Everything we own belongs to him. Our talents, our abilities have been given to us by a creator. God is quoted as saying this in Psalms 50. For all the animals of the forest are mine. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird on the mountains and all the animals of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For all the world is mine and everything in it. He's like, I have no need. I own it all. So that kind of settles it. I mean, right? I'm not real sure that there's another way of saying it more plainly than that. God says, I own it. So the loving and the kind and the over generous and the powerful father says, it's all mine, but I'm going to share it with you. It's all mine. But I'm going to share it with you. This week, with the help of a, a, a friend who goes here to City First, who gave us a great deal, um, my son Connor was able to buy his first car. And, and so um, he's been using my truck for the last uh, couple years. And, uh, and so um, I own a truck, a 2009 truck. I love my truck. It's my favorite vehicle. And, uh, and you know what? I, I love driving that. Uh, Jen can drive the mom mobile. I'm going to drive the truck, all right? But he, Connor, has been using my truck to go to school, and he's been using my truck to go to work. He uses the truck to go out with friends, as he has to, because he has to get there, and so he used my truck. Now, I bought, I bought the truck. It's my money. I bought the truck, all right? I bought the truck. And in fact, to fill up my truck, because it's a diesel um, and it has a big gas tank, it costs about 100 bucks to fill up the truck, all right, for gas. And, uh, and so because Connor doesn't have a full-time job during school, um, he would chip in a little bit, and I'd chip in a lot, all right? And, uh, and so I'm usually paying the greater portion of the diesel gas that I'm not using. It's my truck. but he uses it. I get to use my truck every once in a while. But imagine this. Imagine if Connor looked at me the next time that I went into uh, the little room that we keep our keys in a bowl, and I went and dug in there, and I grabbed my truck's keys, and I started to walk out the door, and he goes, oh, oh, oh Dad, Dad, you can't use my truck. Um, I'm using my truck. 
Now at that point, let me tell you something. I think I'd probably look at him and go, well, first of all, excuse me, son, but this is not your truck. This is actually my truck, <laughs> all right? You get to use it. Secondly, we have an agreement here. The agreement is this. I paid for the truck. I actually chip in the majority of the amount of money for gas. You chip in a little bit, but I get to use my truck when I need it. You get to use it when I don't. Now, how about if Connor looked at me and went, nope, Dad, I love you, I just don't see it that way. <laughs> how many of you know that Connor would probably have a firm talking to and a coming to Jesus moment, right? <laughs> if that were to happen. All right. But you know, isn't that the same lack of logic that we use when we say God owns it all? Jesus has paid the ultimate price so that we have a new life. But when it comes to our stuff, God, that's not your stuff. This is my stuff. And you know what? I get to use the stuff. I get to do whatever I want. We become possessive in these moments. And, and you know what? God says, hey, listen, I'm not asking for all the stuff I've given to you. I just want you to have an open hand. And if I ask for something, I want you to give it. And I want you to use it for a greater purpose than just you. And, and you know, at that moment, though, we kind of get funny when, it, when we talk about money because we're like, no, this is my stuff. But how obnoxiously ignorant is that, right? Because, again, it's all God's. So here's the real goal I want to hit on today. The goal is, is this of our life, to be a good steward of God's stuff. To be a good steward. Now, you know, steward is not a talent. To be a steward, you're not talented to be a steward. You don't get born and I'm a, I'm a good steward. But rather instead, being a good steward is a choice. And, and you know, we want to live a life of blessing. And the only way that God can bless our life is if we're a good steward of what he's given to us. So today as we close, I want to just talk for a moment about what it means to be a good steward. The English Dictionary, Oxford English Dictionary, says this. A steward is a person employed to manage another's property. I want you to think about that when it comes to your life. You're just a steward. You're not an owner. I know some of you are like going, I don't like this sermon. <laughs> but I'm telling you the way it is. I mean, we are not owners. And here's the reason why. You never see a U-Haul on the back of a hearse. It's only here for a season. Money doesn't go with you. Things don't go with you. Your house doesn't go with you. Your cars, whatever. You see, we're stewards. We, we are not owners. So what does Jesus say about being a good steward? I want to read for you a story. This is a real parable. And I'm going to end with this. So we're almost done. But listen to what Jesus said, okay? If you don't take my word for it, Take his. This is what he says in Matthew chapter 25. He was preaching one day. He looked at his followers and he said, Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by a story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one. Now, some of you might be reading out of a translation that says talents. So some of you think, oh, talents, like playing the piano. No. No. A talent back in Jesus' day was actually a way of, in a sense, uh, weighing a quantity of gold or silver. If you were to actually look, and you can get this right off of Wikipedia, okay, today, because I checked to see what the, the latest value was, a talent in today's terms, in today's economy, is equal to $1.4 million. So this is the thing, when Jesus is given this parable, he's not using dollars, he's using millions of dollars. Now they didn't have dollars back then, but in our kind of currency, all right? So when he says five bags of silver, one of the translations says five talents. Well, okay, five times 1.4 million. Okay, this is a big amount of money. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last. Dividing it in proportion to their abilities, he left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. 
The servant who, with two bags of silver, also went to work and earned two more. So they doubled the money, you could say. But the servant who received one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have, been given faith, you have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, here's passive aggressive guy, okay? Master, I knew you were a harsh man. So passive aggressive. Harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. Jesus is not mincing words here. He did not give this a rated G kind of rating, okay? He says, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with 10 bags of silver. To those who use it well, what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I mean, Jesus is going strong in this parable. And you know what it's about? This is about stewardship. All of us have been given different levels of resource. And Jesus is saying, all I want you to do is be a good steward of it. Here's, here's the, the lazy, wicked servant's problem. He had two wrong mindsets. Number one, fear of losing money. Many of us right now have that exact same fear. We're scared. We're gonna lose money, not gonna have enough for the future, that we hang on to everything we have really tightly. We don't wanna be generous because we're like, man, I might not have enough money. That was the wicked servant's problem. The second problem that he had was this, a shortage mentality, that he didn't believe that the, that the master was gonna take care of him. And in the same way, we have a fear many times of losing money, and we have a shortage mentality. Both mindsets are rooted in this lie. This is the lie. This is the foundational lie, okay? If I said the foundational truth is, I belong to God, the foundational lie about money is this. Money is my source. That's the foundational lie. Many of us think money is our source. Money will give us everything we need. You know what? Generosity gives us what riches promise us. Think about that for a little bit. See, giving into this lie of money is my source, right there is where you get your stress from. Right there is where stress comes from. Because if money is my source, then there's a limited amount. If God is my source, there's an unlimited amount. Do you understand that? This is where stress comes from. And I'm telling you, if you deal with this, you are not bad and you are not alone. The vast majority of people in this world struggle with this, which is why Jesus talked about money. He talked about possessions. It's why we do it at City First. You know, I know people on social media are gonna ding me, oh yeah, there's that megachurch pastor always looking for money. It's an ignorant thing that they say that. 
Because I will tell you what, this isn't about money. It isn't about building a bigger church just to build a bigger church. This is about us understanding how to align our lives for the blessing of God and not give into the lie that money is our source. And here's the reason why we're gonna have stress if we do that. So here's the question I wanna leave you with today as we close. Are you a good steward? That's it. We're not gonna take an offering. You could breathe. Oh, okay. Some of your guard in your wallet. It's the end of my sermon. That's it. Are you a good steward? You need to answer that. You might say, how do I become a better steward? I'm glad you asked. Come back next week, I'll tell you. <laughs> Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I just pray you'd help us to be good stewards. With everything you've given to us. Lord, we're like that runaway, adopted into a family given eternal riches, earthly blessings, favor, salvation, love that we don't deserve, forgiveness we didn't earn. But God, I know I'm probably touching on a nerve today with a lot of people because everything in this world says money is our source. But God, you're our source and you've given us everything we have. I pray that this week, Help us to evaluate whether we're a good steward or not. And if there's some areas that we're falling short in, we're gonna talk about it next week, God. And here's the good news. We can become a better steward at any point we choose to. We love you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen.